Welcome to the Dear Katie podcast. My name is Katie Kessner, and I will serve as your host along this journey with all of our survivors and all of our wonderful, supportive listeners. My own journey as a survivor began a long time ago. I had grown up in central Pennsylvania, went to a large public high school with cow tipping as practically a national pastime. And having grown up so sheltered and then heading off five hours away from home to a residential campus was quite the journey in and of itself. I arrived and went through new student orientation meeting. It seemed like five million people in three days with a series of name games. I went to one event at orientation with a, another residence hall and there spied uh, what I thought was an amazing human um, sitting in the same room watching a movie. And lo and behold, we did eventually meet up in a cafeteria not long thereafter, hung out for a little over a week. He asked me out for this fantastic French fancy dinner. And I was, uh, you know, overwhelmed with how debonair he seemed, sophisticated. He could speak three languages fluently and played a great game of soccer. He could, you know, sing and play the piano. I think he wanted to be a brain surgeon. And after our fancy dinner date, I asked him to come back to my residence hall room and hang out since I didn't want to hang out in the bars and the fraternity houses. And back in my room that night, after hours and hours of no, and I'm waiting till I'm married, all of a sudden, um, I realized that he wasn't going to take no for an answer. And it ended up becoming the night that changed my life. And I, I was raped. I was raped by this guy I trusted, the guy I liked, um, someone I thought could have potentially been a long-term partner. And I felt so incredibly upset, moved, hurt, angered, fearful, treated like something I, I couldn't even imagine that I, fe I felt like no one should ever go through what I did. So I shared what happened with my resident advisor, with the local police at my college, with my dean at my school, and many people couldn't believe that that was actually rape. Um, but I persevered and said that no should mean no, and without consent has got to be against um, some law or policy. And speaking out for the first time really nationally and publicly landed me on the cover of Time magazine. HBO decided to make a movie about the story, and since then I have not stopped sharing my story uh, with thousands and thousands of school students on stages um, across the country and even around the world. And it is this journey that brings me to our Dear Katie podcast, because now I want to share that stage with so many other survivors who have such powerful stories and encourage all of you, our listeners, to take this journey with us so that we can shatter the silence and end the violence. So that is, you know, what brings me to this microphone. And I'm so fortunate to have met Claire Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan and I met at UVA a long time ago um, and truly inspired by her own work, I invited her to co-host with me on this podcast. So Claire, welcome and thank you for um, trusting in this process. And could you share with our listeners a little bit about your own background? Thanks, Katie. It's such a pleasure and an honor to join you in this project. I think it can have such an impact um, on the world. Um, I've been an activist and an advocate in the anti-violence movement. I was active in the socialist feminist movement um, back in the 70s and joined the anti-violence movement in the 80s, um, as starting out as a volunteer on a hotline in Los Angeles. And from there, um, did ended up doing some work nationally and wound up running a starting and running a program at the University of Virginia, where I stayed until uh, 2020. And I met Katie back in the early 90s when she came to speak at UVA. And so we've worked together on and off over the years. And it's I'm really excited about this project that it's going to be pretty uh, cool to meet so many survivors and hear their stories and share them with the world. Before we start, we want to remind you that the content of the podcast can be really difficult emotionally, and this can be true for anyone, but especially for people who've experienced trauma. It doesn't have to be sexual assault. It could be any kind of trauma. So if you're feeling very strong feelings, having trouble breathing, that kind of thing, just know that there are resources to support you. Um, it's normal to react that way. So please don't hesitate to re reach out for support 
for information for survivors on the Take Back the Night Foundation website. We'll give you that address at the end of this uh, podcast. Thank you, Claire, for taking care of all of our listeners. As we start every uh, program, we want to hear from a Dear Katie letter writer. Along my own journey, so many of you have shared your stories and your secrets um, and your pain and your challenges with me personally, whether it be by email or old school snail mail. And I um, love hearing the voices of those survivors and I share them all with you, uh, our listeners today. So let's hear from a survivor who wrote a Dear Katie letter. Dear Katie, October 24th, 2002. I had always believed for reasons that seem silly now that letting two people I knew into a house that I somehow deserve to be sexually assaulted. Your analogy about the person whose wallet is stolen from their open car window finally hit home to me and made me realize that regardless of my own actions, being sexually assaulted was not my fault. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome another incredible survivor. May sent in their personal story to me and is now ready to share it with the world. So May, um, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you for having me. Hi, my name is May, and I am 27, and I live in a country called Malaysia in a city, um, Kuala Lumpur. Thank you so much for journeying so far to be with us and our listeners, uh, May. Could you share a little bit about maybe your community, your background, and your personal story? I grew up in Malaysia. We speak English and Malay. We there's there's different cultures here, so you have Chinese, Indians, Malays, Eurasians, Borneans all over Malaysia. We're a multicultural community, and if you've not been here, my country is rich in food and culture. And can you tell our listeners a little bit about what exactly you went through? I met this boy at a party. He was a part-time drummer, full-time student. And at that time, he was studying in the UK. We hit it off really well until I found out that he was unavailable, meaning he had a girlfriend. And we really liked each other. We shared mutual friends. So we decided to just stay friends instead. Two years later, we met up to catch up. And it was a bit odd that he suggested to meet at a nightclub, but I still went. So he picked me up in his blue Suzuki car and he was dressed up nicely in a button down blue shirt matched with a pair of khaki pants. At the club, he bought a bottle of whiskey. And again, I found that rather odd that he would buy a bottle for just the two of us. So we had a couple of drinks. We danced for a bit and we may have shared a cheeky kiss. At about 4 a.m., the music was still blasting out loud, but I was feeling fatigued. So I suggested that we head home. And on the way home, as I was falling asleep, this boy that I was with, he wanted to sleep over for the night. And he kept asking me, can I stay with you? And I said, no, because all I just wanted to do was sleep in my own bed by myself. However, he kept insisting that he slept over to keep me company. And his story kept changing from wanting to keep me company to needing a bed to sleep or to help me upstairs to my bed because I was too drunk. But I wasn't drunk at all. I was just tired. And this all happened on the way home. May, if I could ask um, a quick question just for our listeners' sake. So you were 23, and he was approximately the same age or older, younger, would you say? He was a couple years older than me. Okay. So at this point, you had known each other for- Two years. A few days. Oh, two years. Yeah. 
Wow. And this was the first night it had gotten more romantic, if you will? We got romantic at the start when we first met. Mm -hmm. But because he had a girlfriend, I decided to... I didn't know that he had a girlfriend. And um, when I found out and I knew that things weren't going anywhere... I had to break it off. So we decided to just stay friends. And how did you find out that he had a girlfriend? Facebook. Oh, my goodness. The sneaky Facebook. Yeah. The social media sleuth of all time, right? <laughs> so how, how, did you, how did you feel about him when you first found out that he had betrayed you? I thought that he was a bit sneaky. But he did say that they were on a break. They were sorting things out. They were trying to work things out. And maybe things weren't going to work out. So the naive girl in me believed that. Got it. Got it. So here you are now. He's coming back with you. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. Of course you're exhausted. Yes. (laughs) And you're not drunk, but would you classify him as having that whole bottle? I mean, how much had he had that night? I think we both had uh, the similar amount of alcohol consumption. He had about two glasses of whiskey, and the rest he just left it at the club. So what made this night different? Do you think what did he do you think he came with a plan? I'm always curious in thinking about the you know a predator if they intend if how is it spur of the moment? What was your sense of things? At first I didn't think he had a plan, but as I told my story to more people, I came to realization that maybe he had this in his mind from the start because I told him that I was alone at home. My mom was away uh, and my sister too. So Mm. I think when he heard that, that was kind of a green light for him to. The opportunity had presented itself. That's right. Thanks so much for explaining that, May. So if you're comfortable, please, you know, tell us what happened next. Okay, so just a couple of minutes away from my house, he stopped by the convenience store to get some cigarettes. Then he drove me home. Now he tried his luck again to persuade me to allow him into my house. And again, I said no. So he pulled out his last trick, asking if he could use the toilet. And I had to agree hesitantly because he didn't want to go in the bushes. He needed to be proper, like a proper gentleman. He needed a proper toilet. So I let him in. And he promised to leave immediately. But when he came out from the toilet, he proceeded to sit down. And he said that he won't leave. He wouldn't leave until he tucked me into bed. And I was feeling tired and I really just wanted him to leave. So I agreed to that. Five minutes, he said. So he laid down next to me and then I started to feel his weight shift on top of me and he started to dry hump me. And I just got so fed up because I knew what he wanted. And so I stood up and I said, let's, let's just do it. So I took off my clothes and I let him do whatever he wanted. So he pulled out something from his pocket and it sounded like he was unwrapping a plastic wrapper. It was a fresh new pack of condoms. That's when I knew he didn't actually stop by the convenience store to get a pack of cigarettes. He wanted to get a pack of condoms. 
Mm. Wow. So when he, um, May, you know, I'm imagining with you what happened and, you know, your feelings, you were exhausted and he was persuasive. Was he, did, were you scared at any point or were you just, you know, hoping it would just get over with or how were you feeling? Yeah, I think I could feel my heart beating out of my chest. I was definitely scared, but also just thinking, when is this guy ever going to leave? You know, like mm -hmm. I said no so many times and he won't take no for an answer. Do you feel like he was just wearing you down? Yeah, in a way, yeah. Something that so many women say, they say, I just kept saying no, kept saying no. It's almost like I was speaking to a brick wall and finally I just, gave up because it was the only way to get rid of him you know that kind of thing yeah sounds kind of like that's what you were going through yeah so I was covers to say yes eventually right mm -hmm. um yeah so but that that wasn't actually the part where I thought about it being a sexual assault it was when he pinned me down on the bed when I tried to get out because I said, all right, that's enough. And he pushed me down. And he just, he didn't want to let me go. And that was the time when I said no multiple times. Because I was feeling helpless and powerless. Not being able to fight back. And that feeling made me feel... Like I lost everything in my body. That's so powerful, May. Um, I love how you say lost everything in my body. I think there's so many of us who can relate to just feeling like we've turned from human into nothingness and being lost is so well said. Um, you know, just to, we we cannot wait to hear more about how you've, traversed this pathway of, of journey to healing, but when it was over, did it, did you feel the weight come off you? How did you ever get him to leave? So eventually he did let me go and I ran downstairs. This was at about 6 a.m. in the morning. So this was happening for two hours, about wow. two hours. Um, I stood outside of my house. I threatened him and said, if you don't leave, I'm going to scream for my neighbors to call the police. And that scared him. I had to use the word police for him to leave. Wow. It's mm. a, root, a shock maybe finally that he came to the realization that do you feel like he realized that he had crossed that line? I don't think so, because even though he tried texting me and calling me right after, he sort of, instead of just stopping at, I'm sorry that I did that to you, he went on blaming it on the consumption of alcohol and feeling tired clouded by his judgments mm -hmm. so there was a reason why he acted that way there shouldn't be a reason no it's an excuse but yeah it's, it's not a reason yeah and then what happened may so this night is over and what did you do next um so i couldn't sleep, of course. I was tired, but I couldn't sleep. And the first person I called was a friend who used to work for UNICEF. And somehow he just knew what to do. And he told me, he gave me an advice saying, don't shower, don't do anything because they'll just wash away all the evidence on my body. 
But at that time, I wasn't thinking clearly. And all that was going through in my mind was, I'm filthy. I feel disgusted with myself right now. And how did you get through that whole next day? I remember meeting up with my sisters. The next day, I talked to to another friend about it. And just because she was also in a law firm, and she knew all the legal procedures, I couldn't go through with any of that because I didn't want anyone from my family to know at that time. A week later, my sister found the condom in the waste paper basket in my room. And she questioned me and asked me why I brought a boy home to our family home. Like, she accused me of doing that. That's when I had to tell her the truth. And when I told her that, I could feel her heart shatter because she felt that it was her fault for not being there. And I didn't want her to feel that way because it was no one's fault what happened to me. But it was nice because I got that support from them instantly. And not once did my sisters doubt me and my story. I feel you were carried uh, so well by so many who tried to help you get through what happened and were there for you no matter what. So I, I think that's wonderful. And so many survivors don't have that support. Um, do you think having it having so much and and such closeness has helped you in and in what way yes i think i got lucky that i've been surrounded by the greatest people for for myself my whole life and to have their support from the beginning definitely helped in my healing process have you mended the pain? Have you found some way to, to grow stronger? Today, I don't feel like that anymore. Because I know I found myself again. What I like to do is dance. And just being in the studio, knowing that that's a safe place for me to just freely move, not having anyone touch me or tell me what to do that's just a nice feeling and to be able to move and touch myself for myself i felt like i was starting to take ownership of my own body wow so powerful and um let's talk about your your present tense self and where you are and, you know, what, what do you think good has come from this to help empower you? The good that came out from it was probably me becoming a stronger person. I'm not so naive as I was before. I'm more assertive. I know what I want. And if I don't want it, I'm, I'm assertive with my, with the word no. And that has helped me a lot because I don't have to do things that I don't want to do. Um, and it's not just in like a sexual or intimate relationship. It can be anything. If I don't want to do something, I'm just going to say I don't want to do it like going out with friends, for instance. You can say no. You don't always have to go out. Uh, yeah, so... And, and on that note, I think what's curious to me is whether or not when you say no now and someone doesn't listen, what do you do with the non-listeners in your world? Mm -hmm. Good question. So people who don't respect me 
and my choices. I just let them go. I keep they're, they're gone. They're yeah, gone they're from gone. your life. Bye bye. <laughs> That's so brilliant. Um, that you don't tolerate the uh, those who can't take a, a no for an answer. Yeah. Um, anything else you can think of that has has come from this experience that you'd like to share with our listeners? Talking helps a lot. The more you talk about it, the more you listen to yourself and and know that this wasn't your fault. We talked about what helped you. And I think around the whole issue of, of sexual violence and, and the perpetrators like yours, what would you do um, if you could to make sure that we we don't grow these this mindset that is capable of such disregard for another human. Um, is there anything that you know you you see as helping via an agent of change? I think just finding yourself would help, and I know that's quite a general thing to say, but immersing yourself in your interests and your hobbies, in things that you like. And knowing what's right for you and doing things for only for yourself and not for other people. Yes. I I like that. Let's talk about that just a little bit more, May, because so many of our survivors, they do do things for themselves, but what they do do for themselves is hurtful, right? Like we, we hear from survivors who say, I was immersed in myself, but what I was doing was drinking until I passed out every night, or I was beginning to cut and pierce and hurt and harm. So they're spending a lot of time on themselves, Mm -hmm. but with hurtful, harmful behavior rather than the joyful behaviors that you've been describing. And so I, you know, I think if you could say something to those survivors about how to stop spending the time on themselves in that dark, hurtful space to, to, you know, numb out hurt with hurt, I feel like you've numbed out the hurt by growing an entire new set of branches and flowers and gardens in your world. I had a dog. <laughs> I had a dog. <laughs> and I had my dog, a dog was my best friend. <laughs> oh. And I talked a lot to my dog growing up. Dogs are good listeners, yeah. especially when you have a treat. <laughs> They're free th- therapy (laughs) so yeah just finding a community i think a good community for yourself not the drinking community um play sports exercise that might exercise releases endorphins dance sing yeah, find those find the uppers instead of the downers, yeah. right? I always had this strong mindset. So I I go with a quote. I don't know if you've watched this musical. The name of the musical isn't coming to my mind right now, but um, there was a song called "Always Look on the Bright Side of Life," or there's even a quote. That says um, where where there's a rainstorm, there's always a rainbow at the end. Have you heard of this? I, I think I've heard of both, but I'm a terrible singer, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even do a cartwheel, May. <laughs> Much less, you know, dance. I'll, I I'm not good at that either. So the <laughs> message flogging. Well, the message behind it is so strong. It's just saying. When you're feeling down, don't give up because there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. So just keep going. Don't don't give up on yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much, May, for sharing your journey, your story, your pain, your healing. 
And, you know, all that you are giving to so many with the strength that you exude, I think it's, it's truly inspiring. It shows that we as survivors have so much to find a bigger, better, stronger, more flourishing vision for our world and what we can be despite what others may do to us. So thank you so much. Um, and, and Claire, I, um, Thank you for joining me in hosting May tonight. All I want to do is thank you, May. You have, you are, uh, it's wonderful to hear your story and thank you for being uh, so brave and such a wonderful uh, role model to uh, survivors, men and women and non-binary around the world. And I hope that people can have a chance to listen to your story. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me too. I've had a wonderful time talking to both you and Katie. Yeah, thank thank you you for joining us from half a world away. Um, The greatest thing in the world to me is how close we can all be um, when we simply uh, dial into the World Wide Web and um, offer our voices and our stories. So for all of our listeners, if anything that May had to offer with her story, her journey, was difficult for you and you do need to process more what you heard, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out for support. As you heard from May, there are so many places and spaces where we can find those who will support us, who will believe us, who will want to help us, who will take the time, the effort, and have the patience to be there for us when we need it. If you um, need to find out where those resources are, um, you can certainly contact your local sexual assault crisis center Go to the Take Back the Night Foundation website um, at takebackthenightfoundation.org and or many other organizations. Just Google sexual assault support and you will find it. Thank you so much, Claire. This is Katie Kessner and... And this is Claire Kaplan. This has been the Dear Katie podcast. We hope that you will join us again next week for another session um, with another powerful, strong survivor who will share their journey and their story. So good night, stay safe and be strong. We will together shatter the silence and end the violence. And if there is anything you'd like to share with our audience and have a story that you think will help others, um, please don't hesitate to write in and let us know. Take care and good night. Good night, everyone.